Good morning. Okay. So this morning's reading is in Acts chapter 14, verses 13 through 22. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they are uneducated and untrained men, they marveled, and they realized they had been with Jesus, and seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do with these men? For indeed, that a a notable miracle has been done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But so that it spreads no further among the people, let us severely threaten them that from now on they speak to no man in this name. So they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whatever is right in the sight of God, to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way of punishing them because of the people, since they all glorified God for what had been done. For the man was over 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing had been performed. Thank you, Tim. You know, you have a striking resemblance to a small child with a little high, tiny voice that used to be around here, but I haven't seen him lately, so... (laughs) you got to have grown three feet in the last year, so... Wow. (laughs) Lots of good things coming up. We've already talked about a couple of them. I mean, good things are coming. The new quarter started, so this Wednesday there will be new classes that are starting. Uh, Be sure you're part of one of those. Uh, ministry fair is coming up next week for Bible class so you can come sit in here if you want but there won't be anybody teaching in here we'll all be down in the fellowship hall looking at what the work of the church is and even if you're not going to sign up for anything at least go look at what we're doing because I find it amazing that sometimes people don't have a clue what all goes on here Uh, there's a lot to keep up with and so You just need to be aware of what all is happening, and you may find something you really want to be involved in. Then the next weekend is Ralph Gilmore coming. This guy's a really intelligent guy. I mean, when you're looking at degrees and looking at people who have studied a lot, this is one of the top guys in the world. So pay attention. He's one of those rare opportunities that you'll have to be able to hear somebody like that. So lots of good things that are coming up. So I want to start talking, maybe, (laughs) about evangelism. Is everybody excited about evangelism? Okay, good. (laughs) We got four. (laughs) And they're all elders. (laughs) Well, let's see what we can do about the rest of us to maybe help a little bit on this and try and understand what it's really all about. I think it's one of those things that we have struggled with for a long time and don't know how to do very well. And so, as you know me, I'm going to go back, look at Scripture, look at what happens there, and look at exactly how did they do it, and hopefully we're able to come up with some things that will show us what we're able to do in our day and time. So, starting at the beginning, I get, actually I'm starting at the end. So, what you have is... In Acts chapter 4, you've got a situation with Peter and John. Why do you think we don't do evangelism? Evangelism is not that difficult. I mean, it's basically telling people about Jesus so that they're able to begin a new covenant. Um, That's all there is to it. You just tell them about Jesus and things will work out from there. But I think for some reason, some things get twisted. And we don't quite know how to do them. Uh, I think we just need to look at what they did. You may be aware that the word evangelism isn't even mentioned in the New Testament. So why are we even talking about evangelism if it isn't even in there? There's three cases where it talks about evangelists. So there's Philip, there's Timothy, and there's the appointment of 
leaders or that Jesus has appointed leaders in the church. And one of those is the evangelists. And you would think he would be doing then evangelism. But it's not that evangelism isn't all over it. I mean, it's just one of the main things that they were doing. And it's also one of the most fun. And I think somewhere along the line, we've kind of lost that whole concept and lost how we're able to do that. It's, it's everywhere throughout the New Testament. So as you look at Acts chapter 4, that has been read to us by that strange guy who's really tall and got a deep voice now. Uh, it talks about this boldness of Peter and John. And they've been hearing about Jesus and they're, you know, they're getting tired of this because Peter and John have healed the lame man. Now they're bringing him in saying, we don't want you talking about this anymore. And they're not ready to do that. So they throw him in jail and they bring him out the next day and they bring him into the court and they say, listen, we really don't want you talking about this anymore and we're going to do something about it. And of course, then what you get is the next answer that they're able to give, you know, whether it's right in the sight of God or not, we cannot help speaking about the things we've seen and heard. It is just exciting for them. They have seen it. It's part of them. It's their experience. It's what they have. It's something that they are able to to get hold of, that they are able to take in. And so as you look at what they're doing, this is, well, You know, you can try and stop our story and do whatever you need to do, but we can't stop telling it. Have you ever done something that was really exciting and you can't wait to tell people? Ask Lauren Farr. Okay, she's got some little bit of good news. Uh, She's pretty shy about it, but it's it's pretty exciting, and she's going to tell you and show you about that because that's pretty exciting stuff, you know. Those little rings on the hand, that's pretty good. (laughs) For some reason, it's hard to keep that in. Why is that? Why don't you just, you know, turn that thing backwards and say, no, I don't don't know what you're talking about. Sometimes that's what happens with Jesus. But that's not what happens on all the other times when we're excited and when we've got something we want to tell. What they did is they are taken into court and they saw the boldness of Peter and John. And they recognized they had been with Jesus. It's kind of an odd statement, actually. They knew he, they had been with Jesus. And the last time they saw them might have been as they were running away when they arrested him. It might have been when they saw him at other times, but now they're there with the council and we know they've been with Jesus, but that reference, we've been with Jesus, is a reference also to the boldness that they feel and to the way that they're able to speak because they're not talking like people that, that they used to be. These aren't ignorant fishermen. I mean, we know that's who they are, but why aren't they talking like that? Why aren't we able to threaten them like that? I mean, shouldn't they know they're not that smart? But they don't seem to realize that. They don't seem to know that. Because they have an experience of something that is so much bigger than that. And so they say, we can't stop speaking about our experience, about the things that we have seen and heard. The reason for boldness is when you know what you're talking about. And that's really where they are. Uh, They're talking to people who are in opposition. I'm not sure this is evangelism. They're going to tell the story of Jesus no matter where they are. And if the people will turn, that's great. But, you know, you're running into a lot of opposition here. These people are not really wanting to listen. They don't even want to know about it. But they've had something happen to them. And they very desperately want this to be told, to be shown, so that they then are able to speak about Jesus Christ. So how did they get there? The reason I wanted to start with this passage is because it's the end. That's where Jesus wanted them to be. That's the whole point. That's where he wanted them to be. They're finally at the end. They're not asking stupid questions anymore. They're not arguing about who's the greatest. They're able to stand up against any opposition and say, we believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, we understand who he is and we know who he is and we would call all of you 
to come learn about him, follow him, be able to be part of him. And so as you look at what they're doing here, it's about their experience. So how does Jesus do it? Well, first of all, he takes the long view. It does take about three and a half years for them, but he gets what he wants. I think this may be one of the greatest dilemmas in church today. Because we all want it quick, we all want it short, we all want to say, how can we get this thing going, and, and we're going to take the short one, and it doesn't turn out that well. People are running away from church, why? Well, there's all kinds of different reasons. If you read any article about it, you're going to get a different reason. It can be the hypocrisy, it can be that it's no longer relevant, it can be that, but you know what? I really honestly believe if we had some people like Peter and John, nobody would run away from that. They are the gospel. They believe the gospel. It's part of who they are. And when you've got people that are like that, nobody's going to question their authority. Nobody's going to say, I mean, they might threaten them, but it doesn't change them. They said, well, then... We'll have to deal with you, and you'll have to deal with God. And that seems to be the way it is. Jesus wanted us, and what he did as well, is to make disciples. Here is the end result of making disciples. And to me, our difficulty with evangelism is it, it is not about making disciples. This is what we want to come out with. This is the end of the process. This is where we want to be, to have people who actually know and believe and will stand up and then will call others and disciple them. That has got to be part of this whole process. So how did they get there? We're not going to finish that all today, but let's start and look at what they started with. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 18 it says, while walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And immediately they left the nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them immediately. They left the boat and their father and followed him. Jesus calls them to leave fishing. He calls them to leave their job. He says, I want you to follow me. It's pretty simple at the beginning. Only one command, just follow me. Just walk like me. Just do like me. Just do the things that I'm doing. And so it's a great thing. I, okay. And they leave their nets and they get up and they follow him. He says, I'm going to make you fishers of men. All right, really? Yeah, that's what he wants. I'm going to see, he sees them, and he says, let me help relate this to you. I want you to become exactly what you are now, except for there's a different prize at the end. We're not catching fish anymore. We want to be catching men. And that's really what it's all about. So he calls them, and he calls them to come and to start learning. Now, it doesn't mean that they're stupid. It doesn't mean that at all. They've gone through a lot with this. This seems to be one of the first times when Jesus calls them. We find them also down in, in the Jordan with John, and they're following John as one of his disciples. And so we see that as well. And then, you know, they saw Jesus there, and they have an encounter with Jesus there. And then in Luke 5, you get the other encounter where Jesus comes, and he fills their whole boat, and, and he's about to sink their boat where there's so many fish. And so... I think there's at least three distinct opportunities where he calls them and he says, I want you to follow me. So even though it's very, very simple, even though there's only one command, it's somewhat difficult, right? At least why would people not do that? Well, they decide it's not important. They decide there's no reason for it. I think we need to understand that as well. People don't just jump in right away. And if they didn't do that with Jesus, who's the guy who's there, who's able to do all kinds of miracles, 
The apostles didn't do that. You've got to be aware that other people aren't going to just automatically jump in and say, oh, you want to teach me about Jesus? I would love that. That could occur, but I very much doubt you're going to find very many people like that. So Jesus was not saying, you know, follow me. Oh, well, you didn't do that. You're done. No, there's at least three occasions where he calls, follow me. Follow me, follow me. He wants them specifically. And the last time he sinks their boat and he says, you better get the point. They do. They realize he's got something more. You see, discipling makes, takes time. It, it's not just a simple thing where you can just say, okay, uh, let me give you a set of facts and then you'll be good. It takes some time. And they had already been disciples of John. They had already been looking for the Messiah. They had already been wanting to do that. But you see, when they're down at the Jordan, they're not fishing. They're down at the Jordan listening to John. They're down at the Jordan trying to learn about Messiah. And so when Jesus comes, they need to learn about Messiah. And they finally realize we need to follow him. So when is evangelism easy? Let me just start there. All right, here's the easiest time. The easiest time is when somebody has a question, all right? And they say, would you tell me how to be saved? Great, I'm glad you asked that. You don't run into that question very often, however. It can be some other times when they've got a problem that Jesus can solve. And there are many of those. When they are broken and don't know how to put their life back together, Jesus has a way of putting life together that's meaningful. When they see God working in their life. As you look at Acts, you see when there's a man reading a Bible. Ethiopian, Philip goes up, gets in the car with him. and Do you know what you're reading? Well, let me explain it to you. When there's a lady at church named Lydia. Let me tell you more about what God wants when there's a jailer committing suicide. I know how you can be saved. You see, we've got some examples all the way through here of people who are then taught, but these would be the easy ones. They're in a crisis situation. They meet somebody. Obviously, if they're reading their Bible or showed up at church, well, they're going to be people who are interested, at least, in what God has to say. Then you've got the lame man. It's not recorded that he was ever baptized, but people are watching the miracle and going, hey, we need to know more about that. And so they're wanting to know more about that. They're trying to find out more about that. And he causes many people to be able to believe, and I would imagine himself. When you look at this whole idea of baptism, though, and look at Jesus and baptism, yes, Jesus baptized, or his disciples baptized many people. In fact, in John 4, it says they were baptizing more people than John the Baptist was. What a great thing. Man, they're just doing this all over. And we do not have a single name of anyone that they baptized. Why not? I mean, if that was critical, if that's what was important, then why didn't they record all the names? Why didn't they write them down and say, man, were we ever successful? Look at us. We're doing better than John the Baptist, and he's had a six-month head start on us. But they don't record that. I would assume the 12 are baptized, but they don't record that either. Because that's not the mission. It really isn't. They want them to be disciples of Jesus. And is baptism a part of that? Yes, it definitely is. But at the same time, they were called to be fishers of men. They were to make disciples the same way that we are to make disciples. And Jesus sent them out with that message, with the healing and the power and also the need You realize he did that? Don't take two coats. Don't take two pairs of sandals. I'm going to send you out for a while. There are no hotel reservations. When you get to a town, if somebody says, oh, you could stay with me, take it. 
because I want you to be in the situation of having to learn that I don't have it all together. I have a great need. And other people will help you, and when they help you, they'll listen. It seems to be one of those amazing things that they're so excited about this as they go. And they're able to teach many, many people. Jesus wanted disciples who would speak in his name. He got them. But it did take three and a half years. It did take a lot of preparation. So when is it hard to do evangelism? Here to me is one of the hardest times, and that is when you are related to the person. Not even Jesus could get his hometown. He couldn't even do any miracles there because people didn't believe in him. He didn't get a single brother to follow him while he was alive. Do you realize the example we've got? Don't pick a relative. Okay? You're just going to frustrate yourself. Your relatives are not all that smart. Okay, well, maybe I shouldn't have said that. But anyway, if they ask you about it, that's great. But here's what happens, and it doesn't even have to be a relative. Sometimes we'll go, I'm going to teach you. And you are my target. I'm going to go, and I ignore everybody else, and I'm going to go straight after them and teach them. And God's trying to say, well, there's a guy over here who could use it, and there's a person over here, and there's another guy back there. Yeah, but man, I am focused right here. When you pick the target, that isn't the example we see in the New Testament. Jesus didn't say, there's a guy named Nicodemus. He's kind of interested. You guys go get him. Because most of it has to do with who God is holds, who God leads. And we'll talk more about that, but Jesus says, you know, when I'm lifted up, I draw men to myself. And you guys are there to pick up the pieces. You guys are there for the harvest. And that's really what it's all about, is, is he's able to draw them. Don't think that we are able then, in our great wisdom, to pick the person God's going to do next. Just realize that, you know, there's another person who can be there. And when they don't believe... It gets much harder then. Or when they're completely resistant, like Pharisees. I mean, they are completely resistant to the fact that Jesus is right there in front of them. And they're not even willing to listen to what he's doing. They saw the miracles. They heard the teaching. And they are not converted. In fact, they go to the point of killing him, even though they saw it all. Does that mean Jesus was bad at evangelism? Absolutely not. But he got 11 guys through it, not 12. I know 12 were chosen, but he got 11 guys through it and then a bunch more through them. And so that's one of the things that happens. It's just a matter of being able to realize how we do it. So I think this is the way it happens. Jesus says, come after me. I'll make you fishers of men. It's something you still got to learn. It's something you still got to grow into. And so it's not something you're expected to know already. Aren't you glad? You didn't fail any tests yet. But you learn how to be fishers of men. And that's what Jesus says. I'll make you fishers of men. There's a way to be able to do this that really makes sense. And there's a way to be able to do it. And let's go to where he begins all of this. What do you do first? Well, the first step is do the very first thing. Jesus said, follow me, right? That's what he told every single disciple, follow me. So that's it for today. That's all you have to do is follow me. I mean, follow Jesus, because that's really what it's all about, is being able to realize who he is and to be able to follow them. Now, the first lesson might have taken them a little bit longer. It took them two or three years at least. To be able to follow him. If you can't watch and listen, then you can't follow. And I get people like this all the time that are like, well, I think I'm supposed to do something important. Great. What is it? I don't know, but I think it's important. Well, we could use somebody to teach Bible class. No, that's not it. 
But I could preach for you on Sunday morning. How about Wednesday night? Could you go to a class? Could you be in there? Could you be the teacher? How about Sunday night? They've got a group that meets here, and it's a great time. I'm sure Anthony might like a break sometime. Could you start there? No, no, no. I'm just, I'm way too important to do that kind of thing. God has called me to do this important stuff. Sorry, that's not correct at all. You start with the first step, and he said, follow me. Which means, you carry the luggage. You don't do anything important until you can watch what's going on, until you can listen to what's being said, and until you can take it all in. You see, if you can't sit still and listen, you can't be a disciple yet. Because we have got to be able to listen to God. But when we think of ourselves as so important, we've got to get busy for God, then we get to that guy at the end of Matthew 7. He says, no, I've done great miracles in your name. I've done many mighty works in your name. God, aren't I important? He says, you didn't get the first thing. You've got to be able to watch and listen. Okay, maybe you need a little translation here, okay? Putting that in our day and time. If you can't sit in a Bible class, you cannot be a disciple. Is that blunt enough for you? Because you can't even listen to a lesson that Jesus would teach. Well, we don't have Jesus. We've got several other classes going on. Ashby's in here, Russ is down the hall, Robin's over on the other side, Steve's in the other side. Find the list. Realize it all starts with, I've got to learn to listen to God first. And then he will give you a message. It isn't going to be your message. Then he will give you the message. But the disciples started with, follow me. And they said, okay. What does that mean? You're walking away from your job. Now, I'm not going to recommend you walk away from your job. I'm just saying that you've got to get where you can listen to God. At least make it to church on Sunday. Well, yeah, but I'm busy. I've got all these other things. And, you know, Jesus talked about those kind of people. You know, well, I've bought some land. I've married a wife. I'm doing this. You know, I've got to say goodbye to my dad at home. I gotta, can I go back and say, he said, you're not a disciple. It's real basic. And people seem to think that they come here and, you know, if the show isn't quite good enough, well, eh, maybe we'll go somewhere else. The trouble is, you're saying, I'm not a disciple. I am not a person who can sit down and get something out of it that God is trying to say to me today. Evangelism starts right there. Because until you are the person who has been discipled, you can't call anybody else. We want to start at the wrong place. We want to start as the teacher in the class. You know, somewhere you might need to have taken the class first. It is a little bit important. And so we want to start at the end in Matthew 28, the end of the book. Jesus came and he said to them, All authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe with all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. As you look at this passage, yes, this was the final send out. Perhaps you're there, but I'd venture to say most of us aren't. Most of us are struggling with, you know, can I just get through this time? Can I just even pay attention? Can I get, God, what are you trying to tell me today? That's your question, by the way. God, what are you trying to tell me today? And I want you to ask yourself that in every situation, whether it's a Bible class or whether you're at work or wherever you are. God, what do you want me to do right now? The reason Jesus had apostles like he did is because he trained them like he did and we want, tend to want to do an hour or two hours or something like that and say okay go be apostle how about if we went back and looked at scripture and said this is what Jesus did he says I have all authority in heaven and earth 
So how much authority does Jesus have in your life? And how does Jesus display his authority in your life? I mean, we have to be really tough on this if we want to be disciples of Jesus because evangelism is about being tough. You don't get guys who are willing and able to stand up in front of the court and say, put me in jail, execute me, whatever you need to do, but I am going to tell about my experience. You have to have some experience, not just something that you've heard somewhere. So evangelism is about becoming first, a disciple first. And then you call more, and then you call more, and then you call more. And so that seems to be the way in which they do. I'm really convinced that the reason church seems to be so weak and so difficult is because we've taken so many shortcuts. And we have not really said, Jesus has all authority in my life. And I need to learn how to observe everything he commanded. Because if you're not doing it, you can't show anybody else how to do it. You know the next first thing that's going to happen is, well, you don't do that either, so I guess that one's okay. And as soon as you start that, you don't really have faith in this all authority of Jesus Christ, heaven and earth. So let's start with first things. If you're already ready, you don't have to wait. If you've already been studying about this, you don't have to wait. If you're ready to become a Christian, you don't have to wait. You can be baptized into Jesus Christ today. Just realize what you're taking on. You are taking on that you will learn everything that he commanded, that you will be able to observe everything that he commanded. And the good news is it's not that hard. It's just being a good person and having a good life because he shows you a good way on how to do it. It is such a powerful, positive thing. And we are able to go and share that with so many people because we see so many people in our world that are so broken and that seem not to have any clue how to live their life right. They're desperately trying to find happiness. Are Peter and John happy? I don't think that's really even their question, is it? Do they have some meaning in their life? You bet. They know exactly what they're all about. And they have decided they will be like Jesus. What about you today? Are you going to let him have authority in your life? Or are you going to live for him? Maybe today we need to do something to help you do that. I hope you're deciding right now that that's what you're going to do. And if we can pray for you, or even if we can just baptize you into Christ, I'd invite you to come now while we stand.